There's a, um, a video clip I want to show you in just a minute to help set up. I, uh, it's all based on kind of the behind the scenes of an older hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And I grew up singing that as a kid in the, in the church. And probably uh, if you are maybe my age or whatever, you might have as well. But, uh, I th you know, so much of the lyrics, I'm going to read them to you, I think come right from chapter 19. And uh, we're going to look at the first 11 verses. Again, 19, we finally you know, have the destruction of, of Mystery Babylon during this last seven and a half year period when this tribulation is going on, these horrific events are, are, are taking place, these judgments of God and so forth. In the midst of it, uh, you have a worldwide religious system that is able to draw together all religions under one umbrella. They have their false prophet, is able to do false wonders and signs and so forth. People will be part of this, but it will be corrupt uh, and turn people away from uh, the truth uh, and how they can know the living God uh, and through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, it, uh, it will be part of the one world government that will exist during that time. Uh, and as we have been studying over the last several weeks, chapter 17 and 18 is all about its final destruction in the end. And last week we saw there was tremendous, a tremendous wealth and commercial aspect to this religious system as well. It seems to be eventually centered in a city. Uh, it could be modern-day Iraq, the actual city of Babylon being rebuilt. Uh, that could certainly just be a euphemism or a metaphor for another city yet to be built or an existing city. Uh, but when that city, the commercial aspect of it, is finally destroyed, uh, then we get to chapter 19 and there's tremendous rejoicing going on in heaven. And any time we get a a glimpse through the scriptures in, into heaven. That should always be exciting. Uh, and as they are worshiping and praising God, the, the takeaway for us is that uh, there's things about what should motivate us to worship God uh, despite the circumstances in our lives because there are just times when we just don't feel like it. There's times when we're just going through uh, difficult times. And uh, I was uh, driving here the, this morning. We were, we were crossing, it was a lot earlier in the day, of course. We were crossing the uh, intersection there at Kalaheo and Makapu, and we're just going straight. Uh, and a uh, uh, gal in the left-hand turn lane decided to not turn left and go straight also. And both of our cars can't fit into the same lane. And uh, I happened to notice that she was about ready to run in the side of my car which is not new, but I've only had it for two weeks. It doesn't have a dent on it. And as she was ready to run into the side of the car, I just, out of the side view mirror, by the grace of God, saw her swerve to the right. And by the grace of God, there wasn't someone coming in that lane that would have hit me, uh, uh, made, it, made it around her and, uh, and so forth. But uh, she had run in the side of my car. It would have been really hard to worship the Lord at that point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's life. <laughs> And Jesus said, you will have troubles uh, in this life. But even in the midst of them, uh, whether we're spared from or not, uh, there's, there's still sh plenty here to teach us about how we can be motivated to, uh, uh, to worship the Lord. Let me read you a couple of the lyrics because they, they go parallel with, uh, with our, our text. Uh, this great hymn written uh, in the 1700s, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem, the crown, and crown him Lord of all. So we're going to see that in our text. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. And certainly that grace will be mentioned in this text as well. Stands the three sinners whose love can ne'er forget the wormwood and the gall, speaking of the cross, Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Crown him ye martyrs of your God. And we're going to see them in the text as well. Who from his altar call extol the stem of Jesse's rod and crown him 
Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng, we at his feet may fall, will join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. So we've got a little video clip, a little story behind the, uh, the hymn that I think will help illustrate our, our message this morning. Story that's been duplicated many times around the world. I have a good friend of mine that had a similar incident happen to him in the in the Philippines back in the day when the communists were trying to uh, take over as well. And uh, he was grabbed by a bunch of guys one night in a in a jeep, and uh, they uh, had their their guns out ready to uh, to kill him. Uh, and he he was a missionary there and planted about uh, sixteen or eighteen churches at that point. And very gifted guy, and he just thought that was, uh, that was it. They had uh, beat him uh, for about an hour and now uh, ordered him over into a ditch and took their weapons out to, uh, to kill him. He spoke Tagalog fluently and asked them if he could just have uh, 30 seconds of their time before they killed him. He was ready to die if that's what they chose, him. but if he could just talk to them for 30 seconds, and then he just uh, began to pray, and then he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to him, figured that'd be a good way to, to go out. And, uh, and when he was done, they were all weeping. And they, and they said, we want to know this God. And they all, they all came to faith in Jesus Christ. So the story went on. He actually arranged a program with the government to get guys uh, out of the communist guerrillas and actually funnel them into the regular military. One of those guys he led to the Lord eventually became a general and a leader in the, in the country. Uh, but uh, again, to look death in the face and say, I'll still worship the Lord yeah, any, anyway. There's just times when it's, uh, it's difficult, but in this text, there's some wonderful words of motivation as to, and reasons why we should worship the Lord uh, no, no matter what. I want to uh, take a moment. I'll turn and read. We're going to read uh, verses 1 to 11. Again, Revelation 19 is, is where we're at. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting hallelujah. Salvation and glory, I should say also, and honor and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. Notice that's why they're, they're worshiping, because true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute or the harlot who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Uh, and again, they shouted, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, amen, hallelujah. Then a voice from the throne saying, praise our God, all you, his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah. For our Lord God, should say omnipotent or almighty there, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who were invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, do not do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of, of prophecy. So worship around the, the throne of God. Uh, Louis uh, Giglio, who is kind of the main speaker at the conferences, uh, the Passion Conferences, which are kind of a movement of uh, uh, young people and 20-somethings uh, across the country said this about worship. I thought it was very interesting. He said, I think that all music, not just Christian music, but all music is worship music because every song is amplifying the value of something. There's a trail of our time, our affections, our allegiance, our devotion, our money. That trail leads to a throne. And whatever's on that throne is what we worship. We're all doing a great job of it because God has created us to be worshipers. The problem is that a lot of us have really bad gods. So everybody worships something because we're all created to, to worship. He's saying, if you follow the trail of your affection, your allegiance, your devotion, your money, you follow that trail, you're going to find a throne. And whatever's on that throne 
is actually your God and what you worship. So we all worship. It's just a, a matter of what, what do we worship and who do we worship. And certainly the book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. That we get a bigger picture of him. Uh, that he is not just the suffering servant who came and died for the sins of the world, but he is the risen Savior who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as the song said, all hail the power of, of Jesus' name. So that's what we're looking at this morning. First thing is that there's uh, praise in heaven, and notice it's by a multitude. And uh, there's a great multitude who worship him there in verse 1. Uh, reminds us of uh, other scenes that we've seen in heaven uh, thus far. And uh, just, uh, again, the, the idea there, as it's described in other texts, is that it is a multitude. It's a number that we can't comprehend. In other, in other words, we're going to be around the throne of God one day, and the, the people that are there around the throne of God, uh, church-age believers and uh, from uh, all through the years, will be there, and it's, uh, uh, it's a number that we really can't comprehend uh, the second thing about the multitude is that uh, it includes the 24 elders. Now, this is significant. We've talked about them uh, before because they represent the church-age believers. In the Old Testament, there were 24 courses of priests that, uh, that ministered in the, in the temple of God. So when all 24 courses were there, all the priests were there. Uh, in this case, the elders, in terms of the elders of the church, when the 24 elders are there, uh, it's uh, representative of the fact that all church age believers will be there. And we've seen the consistently in our study, I, I believe that uh, the church at the rapture of the church is in heaven before the tribulation uh, takes place. Uh, again, Jesus in John 14 says that I will come and take you to be with me that you may be also where I am. So he will come and take us to be with him. And of course, then as we get into our uh, next uh, text in chapter 19, we will come with him when he comes back to, to planet Earth. The, uh, the second thing about the multitude, or the third thing, is that of the four living creatures, uh, introduced to them back in chapter 4, the cherubim, uh, and we noted the fact that they are right there at the throne of God, and they are the initiators of worship. When they turn and begin to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, so, so does everybody else. They are the initiator, they are the worship uh, leaders of uh, of heaven. The other thing that we've uh, talked about in some of these scenes is that it's loud. So all, all I can tell you is that if you don't like loud music now, apparently in your glorified body, somehow God is going to give you the ability to enjoy and appreciate really loud worship because that, that's, that's what's uh, going on up there. Uh, and uh, if you want to see what kind of a worship group this is, uh, they're described back in chapter 4. Uh, and in verse 6, they're speaking of them. It says, Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. I just want to ask you, does that sound like a rock and roll band or not? That doesn't sound like a lady's trio to me. Just as a, I'm pretty sure one of these guys is lead guitar, one's bass, and one's playing percussion. Uh, maybe the other one's on keyboard. I'm not really sure. Uh, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they don't rest day or night. So they're just like party animals. They're just at it all the time. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is uh, and is to come. So uh, worship in heaven is going to be loud. It's going to be led by this worship band. This described as the four living creatures. Are you still with me? Some of, you are, some of you are going, that sounds good to me. And others are going, I'm not sure I want to be there. And it's a, consider the alternative. Trust me, you want to be there. Uh, the last thing about this description about the multitude is that it's all his servants, both great and small. So it includes uh, everyone uh, with an emphasis on those that are his servants. So uh, that's what's going on. In heaven, there is praise going on. Uh, the worship band, the four living creatures, they're, they're going at it. They, they're praising God day and night. And when they initiate worship, we saw before, everybody else joins in, uh, including the 24 elders, which are representative of church-age believers. And now we get to the part uh, of something we can kind of take home with us, I think. Uh, there's a multitude, but secondly, there is praise in heaven, and its motivation is, is explained. Uh, as uh, we mentioned earlier, it's just... 
the promise, one of the promises we have of Jesus that we were looking at in our men's study yesterday was the fact that we're actually pr- promised uh, tribulation. Uh, we're promised uh, d- uh, difficulty uh, in this life. The book we were using for our study is Stu Weber's book, The uh, Four Pillars of, uh, of Manhood. Uh, and in that chapter we looked at, uh, Stu says, Oh, how, uh, excuse me, he's start by saying the greatest gift any friend can offer us is the truth. And he's saying that's what Jesus did by telling us the truth about what this life is going to be like. It isn't uh, candy or pablum or painkillers, it's truth. And man, that promise about trouble in this life is truth. Uh, the world's a mess, and if you and I are looking for total satisfaction here, we're going to be disappointed or worse. We need to understand this promise of the Father and receive it with all of its seriousness. Oh, how much time we waste in life trying to get rid of the pain and the suffering in our lives and even those around us. Some of us feel pain at the mere mention of words like home or parents. Other of us are suffering right now because some of the poor choices we've made in life. Some of us are in or have been in relationships that are confusing and agonizing. Some of us are totally undone inside because of the ways our children are responding or not responding to us. Some of us are trudging through years of a less than fulfilling marriage. All of these realities hurt. The pain at times can be beyond belief. But even in the midst of that, the point is we can still worship the Lord. And the motivation is, uh, is given here. The first thing we note in terms of the motivations is one is just his sense of justice. That, uh, again, the, this world religious system that basically is a feature of the Antichrist and uh, and his government during that time that has tremendous wealth that has basically sucked everybody into it. And as uh, we've mentioned before, John, our same writer, says, and the spirit of the Antichrist is already in this world. The thing that keeps men and women and children from receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is Satan at work and through a world system that is against God and Against, uh, uh, against Jesus. Has is, is anybody else noticed that besides, uh, besides me? We're not on the number one hit, hit list of, uh, of, uh, in the media and so forth. Christians aren't exactly uh, uh, lifted up high as being uh, what everyone should want to be like and so forth. Uh, we're pretty much demoralized on a regular basis. They were, we were in John's day and we're in uh, the case today. But uh, despite that, it doesn't really matter. Uh, We have a choice. We can receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and receive forgiveness in a clear conscience for every bad thing that we've ever done. Receive eternal life to know that we'll be in heaven with him one day and the joy and the peace deep inside that he gives us and to look at a sunset or a sunrise or be out on the surf and know that my God made that and I can enjoy it and and I have a peace with him. Or we can reject his love and his mercy and grace and what he's done for us. And, and we can choose to live for self and simply uh, grow old and grow, and grow bitter uh, and have people not like us and be unforgiving towards others and eventually die, stand before God and be judged and we can go to hell. Let's see. Uh, see. Hell, heaven, hell, heaven's tough, tough decision. Think I'm going to choose hell. Why is it a tough decision? Is that a tough decision? I don't think it's a tough decision. Door number one, door number two. Why don't people, everybody make it? Because there is a world system that's out there that is against Christ, against the message of the gospel. It's going to get much worse uh, under this false religious system. And when it is finally destroyed, everybody in heaven is going, hallelujah. But they're not just saying hallelujah because somebody got destroyed. They're saying hallelujah because God is just and he did the right thing. We can trust him. What he says is, uh, is true. And that's what they're, re- they're rejoicing about. Back in chapter 10 and verse, excuse me, uh, chapter 6, verse 10, uh, again, a similar situation. Uh, the, those that have been martyred for their faith, they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And, uh, and that happens here, uh, and we saw that last week in chapter 18. Uh, back in chapter 15, verse 3, they sing, the song, uh, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. 
Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. Your judgments have been manifest. They are true. God is faithful to his promises. He will do everything that he said he will do in the future. Uh, and when people have to stand before God one day, nobody will be able to say it's not fair. No one will be able to say that. You know, and sometimes in our sharing and talking with other people about our faith, sometimes we get different responses. And sometimes uh, one of the responses, oh, that sounds great. You're living here uh, in a Western culture. You're here in Hawaii. You, you can hear the gospel. What about the people that have never heard? What about the, you always get the pygmies in Africa. I used to know this guy hit a track called the pygmies in Africa and then he could take it out. Well, here's the answer. Here's the pygmies in Africa. You know, everybody's concerned. Maybe God's calling you to the mission field if you're really concerned about the pygmies in Africa. You know, God could be, not be working on your heart not only to save you, but actually raise you up and send you off uh, to somewhere uh, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, but the point is that what we can say is, I don't know how God will deal with that. How will God deal with the person who's never had the opportunity to hear the gospel? Here's what I do know. He is just and true. Uh, and everything that he does is just. And when we get there and we see how he deals with every person, we're going to go right on. I could have never thought of that, but that is perfect. That is absolutely just God will never be unfair. And that's what they're worshiping God about. This, oh, this, this wild praise in heaven is going on because God is just and, and God is true. And we can worship and be thankful for, for that very same reason. The other thing that is interesting about this scene in verse 3, it says, again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Now, we we mentioned this uh, last Sunday, the fact that when Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth uh, and we are with him, uh, the Earth will be recreated environmentally with not the, the faults and the decay of, of the fall, no hurricanes and so forth, none of those things go, uh, going on. It'll be a, a beautiful place except for two places on the planet. One of them, Isaiah 34, we talked about that last week, is down in southern Jordan, the area it's called in the Hebrew Basra, or uh, present-day Petra. There's where a remnant of Jewish people during this time of tremendous persecution will be supernaturally protected by God. Uh, and when Jesus Christ comes back to battle the enemies of this world leader, the Antichrist, and destroys them, the smoke from that place will rise uh, as well. The other place is wherever this city is, wherever the commercial center of this aspect of the last world religion, whether it's present-day Babylon, a future city we don't know about, it's very interesting when God destroys it, it just doesn't just like vanish. It could. I mean, God could just like, you're gone. But he doesn't. He allows the smoke to rise from that place forever and ever and ever so that you and I will never forget and always remember that that which plagued us all of our lives, that world system that lied to people and cheated people of their very hearts and their very souls, uh, God did judge them. And it will be a constant reminder to us that God is just and we'll worship him for the same reasons. Uh, the second motivation is his sovereignty. We see that in verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of the great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of a mighty thundering saying, Alleluia. And again, the Alleluia is just the Greek. Hebrew would be with the H, Hallelujah, both meaning praise the Lord. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So God is powerful. He's omnipotent. There's nothing that he can do. That's what Job says in <clears throat> Job 42, 2. There's nothing that you cannot do. He says, I know that there's nothing you cannot do. No plan of yours can be thwarted. So uh, they're worshiping God because he's sovereign, because he's all powerful. Are you glad that your God is the one that's all-powerful as opposed to the one that is almost all-powerful, but there's one that's actually more powerful than, than him? Oh, we worship you, God, because you're like almost all-powerful. You know, we, No, we can worship him because he is ultimately sovereign, in control. He is all-powerful. He will come back. He will establish his rule on this earth, and, uh, and we will be part of it. And it's something that we can, even when we're having a bad day, it's something we can worship him for. The third motivation is in this song of praise. It's actually in verse 1. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Uh, there's a definite article in front of each of these. So it's the salvation, the glory, the honor, the power. 
Uh, all, all attributes, all things about God that we can worship him. Uh, even when the, I used to actually have a list uh, I carried around in my Bible for a number of years as a young believer, and I was still going through a, a, lot, of, a lot of difficulty and, uh, and just with uh, drug addictions and just a lot of junk in my life I was trying to come out of. And uh, not every day was a good day. And uh, I had a list that I kept for reasons to praise God. And it had stuff like this in it. You know, because it, uh, I couldn't always praise him because I had a good day. I couldn't always praise him because people responded to me one way or another. Uh, it, was, it was tough. And in those times, actually, we still can, there's power in, wor- in worshiping God. There's power in, uh, uh, in worshiping uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we were talking about in our study in Isaiah a few Wednesday nights ago uh, about the fact that uh, in Malachi 3.16, you can look it up like John 3.16, Malachi 3.16, Malachi the prophet says that that when we're even speaking to one another about the goodness of God, God is listening and he's recording and he's he's remembering and we can actually bless him in that way. Uh, It's a powerful thing to to worship the Lord. And sometimes we need a motivation that's beyond our circumstances. Uh, Again, the salvation. We can always praise the Lord for our salvation. We're going to be with him. Uh, Just lost the house. Lost the job? Well, going to be in heaven one day. <laughs> there was a, I love a story. There was a, a, a pastor I heard tell a number of years ago, uh, and it was about a, an older pastor, and, um, and he was, uh, the, the church board uh, felt like it was time for him to retire and kind of move on, and he'd been at the church for a number of years. Uh, they wanted to bring a younger guy in, whatever the motivation, whatever the reason, true story, and um, they decided to do that, and they brought him in and talked to him and explained the situation to him. Uh, but, of course, they were concerned, so they, they uh, said, uh, well, uh, what will you do now, Pastor? You know, they're thinking, you know, I hope you, <laughs> I hope you got some retirement here or something somewhere. And he said, well, I'll go to heaven. Oh, hey, praise the Lord. Yeah, we're all going to heaven. Yeah, but you know, what will you do now? You know, I mean, you're not going to have a job here in another two months or whatever, so what will you do now? I'll go to heaven. And this thing went around about three times. And finally he said, listen, whatever happens to me in this life really doesn't matter a hill of beans when it comes down to it because I will be with Jesus for all eternity. I can pastor this church, another church. I can beg on the street. It doesn't matter. Jesus Christ is my Lord. I'm going to heaven. Salvation. Whatever's going on, that's a huge thing to praise the Lord for. Glory. We say that this is one of his attributes, part of his character, and Kathy and I like to have uh, discussions. She does likes to do word studies, and sometimes for months, and one, <laughs> we went through a period of time. She read every verse, had everything to do with the, the glory of God. Uh, and we would talk about it, but I have to tell you, I have no idea what it means. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you try to, it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. You know, you can kind of get there, but it just doesn't want to stay. Uh, but... Uh, what we do know is in, in the Old Testament, God's glory was seen and, uh, when uh, Solomon dedicated the temple and the sp- smoke filled the temple, his Shekinah glory, we call it, uh, and it was his visible presence. We say they saw his glory. It was so heavy, the priests just kind of got down on, on their faces. They couldn't even continue to, uh, to do the sacrifices or, or worship. Uh, his glory was seen certainly when he delivered the children of Israel out, out of Egypt and he led them by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at, at night. When Jesus takes Peter, James, and John uh, up on the mountain there in northern Israel uh, and peels back the time-space continuum and says, I want you to see who I really am, and he shines. It's just a bright light that they're, they're looking at it and they're trying to, to describe it. He was showing, trying to show them his his glory, but it also speaks of, again of his, his character, the fact that he's trustworthy. Psalm 24 speaks of his glory. In verse 7, it says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. That means the Lord of armies. He is the king of glory. So who's who's the king of glory? Is it God the Father or is it Jesus Christ? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. 
It says, we speak with the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus is the Lord of glory. He's the king of the armies, and we can praise him for his glory. Also for his honor, he's, uh, uh, he has an exalted position above all authority, above all uh, anything that else could rule, anyone that's ever ruled in human history. We can uh, praise him for his power, again, for his greatness. No one can do what he can do, and, uh, and no one can manifest himself the way that he does and is glorified even during the tribulation period that we're studying about but again, all of these things that we've just mentioned are all reflected in Psalm 96. So if you're having a bad day and can't really think of how to worship the Lord or what to say, and you want to say what they say in heaven when they're worshiping, just turn to Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. That's one of the things we talked about. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also was firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. It's one of the first things that we talked about. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all of its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he's coming. For he's coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Pretty reflective of, the, of this song that's being, uh, being sung uh, in heaven. So there's a multitude that's praising God, worshiping him. There's some of the motivation that's explained, but that continues here uh, in, the, in verse 7. There's a praise in heaven because of the marriage supper of, of the Lamb. Now, again, this is interesting because it really pertains to us. We're the ones that are at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, Jesus talked about that. And when we have communion, when Jesus instituted the new covenant at the end, when he took the bread and broke it and said, this represents my body that's going to be broken for you. When he took the cup and said, this now represents uh, my blood, which is poured out so that this new covenant could be established with you. And he throws in this little line from a wedding. And he says, and I won't drink it again until I drink it with you anew in my father's kingdom. When, again, when, when the uh, when the guy was engaged to the gal, there's a ceremony that they go through and they, uh, they drink the cup of wine together to kind of seal the deal of their engagement. And he says, I won't drink it again until I drink it with you when we're married. So I'm not drinking with the boys anymore. I'm not going to have that kind of joy in my heart until I'm with you. And then I'm going to experience the ultimate joy uh, in terms of marriage. So Jesus just throws that in right at, right at the middle of the, uh, the Passover Seder. And it kind of relates to this, because later he talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And they're, they're, they're pretty excited about this marriage supper of the Lamb thing. First thing we said is they rejoice at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. The word rejoice means to jump for joy. So, so in heaven, when they think about the marriage supper of the Lamb... In heaven, when we're in heaven and we're singing this song, this is future, right? And we're in heaven. When we're in heaven and we're singing this song, apparently we get a little more demonstrative than, than we do right now about, about, about worship. Uh, this word is also used talking about <clears throat> we should rejoice even when we are persecuted and people come against us. I, uh, one of the guys that taught the the first home fellowship that uh, the church really grew, grew out of uh, that I ended up teaching, uh, the original teacher was Danny Lehman. Uh, and if you know Danny, he's uh, been a missionary for a number of years, trains missionaries all over the world. And 
he was uh, in love. So he's just one of those guys, just loves to go out witnessing and never goes, never leaves home without a track in, in his back pocket and so forth. He was telling us one day, he went down a whole street, uh, knock on the door, try to share the gospel, try to give a track out, and every door either slammed in his face, nobody was home, or, or engaged in conversation a little bit, they found out he was born again Christian, slammed the door, it was all the way down the whole street. He gets to the end of the street, he says, I was just a little bit discouraged, and I thought of the verse that said, we're to rejoice uh, when we're persecuted, and I knew that, that that verse meant to jump for joy, so I decided I'd stand on the street corner and just Kind of jump for joy for a little bit here. Hey, all right. Okay, I feel better. I'm going to the other side of the street now and just keep going. That that's very t- typifies that Dan, Danny Lehman in terms of being a witness for the Lord. And if the Bible says it, let's do it, you know, kind of a thing. But that's the idea here. We are going to jump for joy at the thought of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Secondly, we're going to rejoice because, uh, because it's the supper of, of the marriage. And this helps us explain a, a couple of things. I've taught, I've heard many others teach that after the rapture of the church, we're in heaven with the Lord. And some point in time, uh, during that time, during the tribulation is going on down here, we're going to be having this little party up in heaven. I think we're still going to be having a great time and rejoicing in the Lord. But uh, again, the idea that the marriage supper of the Lamb would take, because it's for church age believers, it would take place during that time before we return. But actually, if we follow the typical process of a Jewish wedding at the time of Jesus, uh, it goes something like this. Kids are uh, uh, betrothed to one another. They're engaged, usually at a very young age. Contract is signed, <coughs> done deal, Joseph and Mary. Even though they've never lived together, never consummated the thing, ne- never nothing, never had the rest of the ceremony, nothing, uh, if they want to separate and not go through with it, they have to get rid of divorcement. So it's, it's a pretty, it's a binding uh, legal thing. And... Um, Sometimes we, uh, we scoff at this idea of uh, arranged uh, weddings, except for fathers who have little girls. They think it's a really good idea. <laughs> and uh, I thought it was a pretty hot idea myself for a long time. <laughs> when we're in uh, India, uh, they still do the arranged uh, weddings there. So every time we're riding on a train or somewhere uh, going in the back of a car, and we got one of the Indian guys with us who's uh, married, we say, so how'd you meet your wife? Because we, <laughs> we want to hear the story because we know it's an arranged uh, arranged uh, wedding and stuff. Some of them, are, but and it's typically uh, his pastor uh, kind of meets another dad, and they think, yeah, I think they'll be a nice couple. We should introduce them, uh, get the parents together first. Yeah, we're 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 open to this and everything. And this one uh, brother Lalich, and he uh, he tells us so. He travels to the city. They go to church, and she's in she's in the church service. So he's kind of. You know, but she's on the other side of the church. And then after church, the parents talk a little bit. It's agreed that he and his pastor can come over to the house. And, uh, and there they are. They're, they're allowed to now uh, talk together in another room with the door open and the parents right here. And um, this is to discuss whether they should be married, right? I mean, it's like, hi, my name is, hi. And he takes out his list. Well, if we're to be married, I have several things I have to say to you. Here's my list. And number one of the list is, uh, I'm, a, I'm a missionary. I'm out preaching the gospel. My life is given to the gospel. It's going to be difficult at times. So number one thing, if you're my wife, you can never grumble. <laughs> I said, wow, did you make it to anything else on the list? He goes, oh, yeah, I had like 40 things on the list. And he says, and then she had like 22 on hers, and she went through her whole thing. They all agree. That's all fine with them. Anyway, they've got three kids, and he's planted about 30-some churches in, uh, in India, and going full guns. And of course, if we, if we say anything about it, they'll remind us that their divorce rate is much, much lower than ours. So they'll say, now you tell me which is working better here. But, uh, but that's the first phase. Uh, arranged marriage, you, you sign the deal. That's done in the bride's home. The guy goes with his parents, the matchmaker, whoever, they go to her home. Very important. They go to her home, contract is signed, and now they're in a sense, married, that's the first stage of, of the marriage. Now, the second stage happens much later. That's where the guy says, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until I'm with you someday in my Father's kingdom. <clears throat> that's what Jesus says, and that's what he's referring to. The second phase takes place when he comes for her, and he takes her to his Father's house, uh, and they begin the, the more of the formal ceremony, what we think of as getting married, reciting vows and prayers and, uh, and those kinds of, kinds of things in, in the Father's house. 
The third stage is now he takes her back to her house for the marriage supper. And that's when the big party can go uh, about a week, usually. And those days we go for about seven days. So that's, that's what Jesus is speaking about here. Therefore, Jesus leaves his home. We're the bride of Christ uh, in the New Testament. Jesus leaves his home and comes to our home, earth. And we become engaged or married to him as the bride of Christ because he dies for our sins. We receive him. We enter into this relationship with him. He then leaves. At a point in time in the future, he comes back for the bride to take the bride to his house. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you, just like the husband would do. And I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. Third phase of the, uh, of the wedding is the marriage supper, which then they go back to her home, and that's where the marriage supper takes place. So if we follow the metaphor, Jesus Christ leaves heaven. He saves us. The rapture of the church, he takes us back to heaven. And then we come with him back to planet Earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So if you follow the, mer- the metaphor and the illustration, the marriage supper of the Lamb does not take place in heaven. It takes place at the beginning of the millennial kingdom when we come back with Jesus Christ. Anyway, I thought that was very interesting. The, uh, but uh, that's what they're so excited about. That's what they're, they're, that's what they're, they're jumping for joy over, is the, the thought of coming back to planet Earth with Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom and have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's what they're worshiping God about. They're motivated by the fact that he is is just, uh, that based on his glory, his honor, the salvation he's given us, his power, his sovereignty. uh, They're they're jumping for joy and worshiping heaven over this. These are all things I think that uh, can motivate us as well. Uh, Again, the third thing about the marriage supper is the bride's apparel. Look at that in verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arraigned in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So again, in Revelation 19, the wife is the church of of Jesus Christ. Paul speaks about this in Ephesians 5.25, where he gives the instructions for wives to submit to your husbands, for husbands to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Uh, And then in verse 32, after he goes through several principles of marriage, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he says, yeah, these are principles for marriage, but primarily I'm talking about Christ and the church, what he's going to do for, for us. Verse 27 says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, and not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Jesus Christ is going to give for us or make us so that we are without spot, no defects, without blemish, we've never been injured, uh, that we are actually holy uh, and, uh, and so forth before him. So these are, the again, the, the righteous garments, in a sense, that Christ will be giving for us. Now, in Matthew 22, the kingdom of heaven is likened to, a, to a, a wedding supper. Remember the story that Jesus told us, says there's a king, his son's going to get married, and so he sends uh, his servants out into the, uh, to the highways to all the invited guests and say, it's time to come to the wedding. And they've, many of them refuse to come, speaking of the religious leaders of that day. So then he sends them out into the highways and the byways and just tells everyone out there, you're all welcome, everybody can come. Uh, and then later at the, the wedding itself, in verse 11, Matthew 22 it says, but when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on wedding, a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing in teeth. You get the idea this is talking about more than just a regular wedding? <laughs> uh, for... That would be bad if you went to a wedding. Uh, it's a really a lousy Aloha shirt. Bind that guy up and throw him into outer darkness. So we're, we're definitely, everybody with me here, this is more than just a regular wedding. I'm going to have to start getting you to say amens or something, make sure we're all tracking along here. Verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. So the guy without the pre- proper uh, Aloha shirt on, he's, uh, he's kicked out of the whole thing uh, because he's not wearing the garment that should have been provided for him. 
And again, it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that gives us uh, that proper apparel to wear uh, at the wedding supper uh, of the Lamb. Romans 3.28 talks about the fact that we are declared righteous by faith. Paul says the same thing in Romans 5. And Paul says in, in Galatians 2.16, again, that it's, it is by faith that we are saved through grace. This is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not that of work, so that no one can boast. So we are given this righteousness by Jesus Christ. That's why we're able to celebrate with Jesus at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And that's why they're jumping up and down in heaven. By the way, that's us jumping up and down because this is future tense uh, one day. But I think we can still jump up and down right now, maybe just on the inside. <laughs> of the fact that we will be with the Lord someday. We will be at the wedding supper of the Lamb. We will wear garments that he's given us. He will present us to himself as a bride without any blemish, without any defect, holy and perfect before him. You feeling real holy and perfect this morning? Probably not. But that's the way Jesus is going to make us one day. Uh, and in heaven, they rejoice over it. And I want to suggest it should be something that we can rejoice over, over now. Amen? Amen? Okay, hey, now we're going. 3D, we're to rejoice because the invitation. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. For the fourth beatitude of, uh, of the book the Lord does call us, draw us into a relationship with him, uh, and he continues to call us. Back in chapter 3, verse 20, uh, they are talking to the church at Laodicea. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with, with me. Now, sometimes we use this in trying to explain the gospel to nonbelievers, and we say, it's up to you. Jesus is at the door knocking. He's at the door of your heart knocking. It's up to you whether you'll open the door and let him in. And I think it's a fair game to try to explain the fact that we personally, each one need to receive the gospel. We need to respond to what God uh, is offering us. But at the same time, in context, it's talking to Christians. It's talking to Christians that uh, Jesus is there each and every day. Knock, knock, knocking on the door of our hearts as believers. Will we let him in? Will we let him be the Lord of our lives? Will we let him control our destiny? If we think about our, our money and our pleasures and our time and so forth and our affections, all these things, and we follow the trail and we get to a throne tomorrow morning, what's going to be on it? What are we singing about? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Because each and every day he's there knocking at the door. Uh, and when we put him on the throne, then we worship him because he's just in everything that he does. There's plenty of motivation because of his honor, his glory, his strength, and his sovereignty, uh, regardless of what's going on in our lives. So there's a multitude that's worshiping in heaven. The motivation is explained, and, and uh, part of that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Verse 10, there's praise in heaven because the mission of the church is restated. It's our mission to worship Jesus. The Apostle John, he's a little excited about all this. He's like really excited. He's so excited that the angel that's telling him, he just goes, he gets down and starts to worship the angel, right? Angel's like, uh, uh, you're going to get us both in a lot of trouble here real quick. You know, the last guy that did that, you know, he's, you know, that guy, Satan, Lucifer, got kicked out of here. Yeah. Would you please stand up very quickly? I'm kind of throwing a little bit in here, but uh, nonetheless, John gets so excited, right, that he, he gets down to worship the angel, and the angel responds saying, I'm just a, I'm just a, a fellow servant here. Yay, you know, get up. God is the only one to be worshipped. God is the only one to be worshipped. He's the only one to ever be on, on that throne, and that's the mission of the church. The mission of the church is not the evangelization of the world. The mission of the church is to worship God. And if we worship God and we put him on the throne each and every day, and we remain motivated based on what the Bible says and not my circumstances of my life or what I feel like at the time, and then God's kingdom is going to advance and spread on its own. Sometimes we like to say in uh, we, um, Calvary Chapel pastors that uh, healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. Uh, if, if you're fed and you're nourished as we worship God through the study of his word, then you're going to reproduce yourselves uh, out there in, in, in the world. So evangelization is wonderful, but it's a by byproduct of having a relationship uh, with the Lord. 
if you're not really sure about your own relationship and the security that you have and knowing that you're going to be with the Lord one day, uh, and you're not sure that you're saved by grace and by grace alone, you're probably not going to be telling that to somebody else. But if you know in your heart that God has saved you, you're going to be with him forever. Whatever happens in this life, like that pastor that was being forced into to re- retirement, I, it doesn't matter what's happening because I'm going to heaven. That kind of person is going to tell other people about heaven as well. So it's our mission uh, to worship Jesus, and that's restated uh, here. Uh, notice also that uh, uh, Hebrews 1.16 says, Let all the angels of God worship him, speaking of the birth of Jesus. So we have a contrast here. The angel says, don't worship me, worship only God. Hebrew tell, tells us that at the birth of Jesus, to, to worship him to the angels. Again, reaffirming the, the deity of Jesus Christ. Secondly, it's our mission to glorify Jesus in prophecy. And, uh, and that's what we've, we, we've tried to do. It's kind of an interesting line, isn't it? That the, uh, the spirit of prophecy is Jesus. So when we teach about prophecy, we should be teaching about Jesus Christ. If this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, then we should be exalting Jesus Christ uh, every time we do a study. Uh, David Hawking says this in his, um, his uh, book on Revelation, Coming World Leader. Prophecy is intended to glorify Jesus Christ. He is the central feature of it. And any teaching of prophecy that takes our minds and hearts away from him is not being properly communicated. The name of this book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It unveils the character and the glory of God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I was uh, actually looking uh, in an uh, older Ravi Zacharias book for something else this week, and uh, I've got a lot, a lot of earmarks and a lot of underlines in, in that book. But uh, I came across this line, and he's quoting uh, Napoleon. And uh, Napoleon is... Uh, uh, been exiled on uh, St. Helena, uh, an island off the coast there. He's having a discussion with one of his, uh, one of his leaders, and he asks him, uh, uh, says, can you tell me, uh, who, tell me who Jesus Christ is? And he declined comment, so then Napoleon jumps in and, uh, and, and says the following. It's a little lengthy, but it's, uh, uh, it's good. Napoleon writes, well, then I will tell you. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself have founded great empires, but upon what did these creations of our genius depend? Upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire upon love. And to this very day, millions will die for him. I think I understand something of human nature, and I will tell you, all of these were men, and I am a man. None else is like him. Jesus Christ is more than a man. I have inspired multitudes with such an enthusiastic devotion that they would die for me. But to do this, it was necessary I should be visibly present with the electric influence of my looks. I guess he thought he was pretty hot looking. (laughs) Sorry, I I just couldn't help stopping there. I didn't really mean to do that. My words of my voice, uh, and I I don't doubt, he inspired millions that were willing to, or uh, thousands anyway of his men, quite willing to die for him. That's how he conquered the world. It says, when I saw men and spoke to them, I lighted up the flame of self-devotion in their hearts. Christ alone has succeeded in so raising the mind of man towards the unseen that it becomes insensible to the barriers of time and space. Across a chasm of 1,800 years, Jesus Christ makes a demand which is beyond all other, others difficult to satisfy. He asked for that which a philosopher may often seek in vain at the hands of his friends or a father of his children or a bride of her spouse or a man of his brother. He asked for the human heart. He will have it entirely to himself. He demands it unconditionally. And forthwith, his demand is granted. Wonderful. In defiance of time and space, the soul of man with all of its powers and faculties becomes an annexation to the empire of Christ. All who sincerely believe in him experience that remarkable, supernatural love towards him. This phenomena is unaccountable. It is altogether beyond the scope of man's creative powers. Time, the great destroyer, is powerless to extinguish this sacred flame. Time can neither exhaust its strength or put a limit on its range. This is it which strikes me most. I've often thought of it. This is it which proves to me quite convincingly the divinity of Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ has an ability beyond time and space with people that have never seen him, never physically been with him, to be introduced to him and have an incredible love for him that he demands, he asks for, and we give. And only God could do that, Napoleon says. It does, it's, it's beyond. He says, I can inspire a few people, but I've got to be right there with them. But not so with Jesus Christ. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Angels prostate fall. That's what's going on in heaven right now. And John gives us these little glimpses, right, in, in heaven and says this is what it's going to be like. And we can just listen to what they're saying and look at who's there and it should change the, the motivation of our own heart at times because in this world we will have troubles. But despite that, we should still be worshipers of God no matter what.